Hello, my name is Adrian Goldberg and welcome to Byline Radio, or if you're listening on Catch Up, to the Byline Times podcast. The Byline Times, it's what the papers don't say, what radio doesn't report and what TV doesn't tell you. This time, your hopes and fears about the arrival of Liz Truss as Prime Minister. She is, of course, replacing Boris Johnson, forced to step down in disgrace after Partygate and his backing for Deputy Chief Whip Chris Pincher. Truss arrives in the midst of a cost of living crisis that is destined to get worse amid industrial unrest, the NHS in crisis, with the fallout from Brexit and with international tensions rising after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. If it's a mess, then it's one that she has helped to create, having held cabinet positions since 2014, most recently serving as Johnson's foreign secretary. Will her arrival at number 10 do anything to improve things? We'll be hearing shortly from Byline Times editor Hardeep Matharu and our Westminster correspondent Adam Biankov. First, though, just a reminder that both Byline Radio and the Byline Times podcast are funded by subscriptions to the Byline Times, our brilliant monthly newspaper edited, as I say, by Hardeep. We can report without fear or favour and hold the rich and powerful to account because our funding comes from ordinary subscribers people like you. There is no corporate interest, no millionaire backer, no non-dom telling us what to say. So do please, if you can, subscribe to the Byline Times. Get more details on our website, bylinetimes.com. That's at bylinetimes.com. And if you have already subscribed, thank you. So Hardeep and Adam, welcome. Hardeep, I want to chat with you first. And just the question really of Liz Truss's legitimacy. She was elected by 80,000 members of the Conservative Party. In the first round of the leadership battle, she was backed by just 50 Tory MPs. Is she a legitimate Prime Minister? Well, I think that's a very, very good question, Adrian. And today we find ourselves with yet another new Prime Minister that has been selected by the Conservative Party members in the country. I mean, it's just incredible that, you know, we have another new leader at such a point of crisis in terms of, as you say, how much of the vote she actually won. And it was actually, I think, closer than many people expected. Uh, It wasn't a decisive win, I would say. And of course, it hasn't the legitimacy of the fact that there is no general election for now. I think the third time with a new Conservative Prime Minister does call into question her legitimacy, I think, from the start. And it's, it's really interesting because I, I wrote this on social media that usually when there's a new Prime Minister, there's uh, a sense that there is a new era beginning, whether that's for good or for bad. You know, you do feel that a shift has happened and we're about to see a new phase of things. And yet today, I certainly feel that this isn't a new era. It just feels like a continuance of what we've had under Johnson. And indeed, Liz Truss, in her brief acceptance speech, even paid tribute to Boris Johnson in particular, called him a very good friend of hers, said he's admired from Kiev to Carlisle. And so I think there is a question of how legitimate she is, considering she's yet been selected again by um you know, a few hundred thousand members of the Conservative Party in the country, but also, you know, how legitimately can she claim to be a real break from the Boris Johnson era, who just a few months ago we were hearing had caused so many problems with the country and that the Conservative Party had to move on from him. So I don't feel all that optimistic today, unfortunately. Mm. Adam, let me talk about her policies, because she's very much of the tax-cutting school of Conservative, to the right, if you like, of centre in terms of the Conservative Party. But she has this cost of living crisis to deal with, the rising price of energy. So how is she going to square the circle of tax cuts and at the same time ensuring that the poorest members of our society don't die of cold this winter? Well, yeah, she's been on a bit of a political journey over the course of her career. I mean, she famously started off as a Liberal Democrat, making a speech at their conference calling for the end of the monarchy. She then later became a Cameroon sort of centrist conservative, remained supporting, and then later sort of shifted to the right once Boris Johnson became prime minister and became a sort of hardline Brexiteer. But I think throughout that, there has been a sort of consistent kind of economic liberalism that she has shown and that that she believes people who know her say that she does actually believe in kind of uh, sort of small state, uh, sort of pro-market policies, and she is kind of ideologically much firmer in her convictions on that than, than Johnson ever was. Johnson 
famously sort of moved from issue to issue and stance to stance without worrying too much about any change in position but purely to ensure his own survival with trust i think there is actually a core of ideology there and when it comes to the cost of living crisis I mean, she's been pretty clear throughout this campaign that she is opposed she even said I, I don't like handouts she said that she's she's committed repeatedly to saying that she will not increase taxes she's opposed windfall taxes so she really has boxed herself in because the, it's pretty clear that, that she is going to have to announce a pretty hefty package to support the public and businesses through this crisis. But she's ruled out most of the ways that, in, in which to pay for that. So it's going to be quite hard for her to square that circle unless she commits a, a series of pretty major U-turns in the next few days. Yeah, she has promised an energy plan within a week of entering Downing Street. The most commonly supported view that I've seen or the, the, the view that's most commonly associated with her is that there will be some kind of crude price cap. But if that is the case, then that will disproportionately favour wealthy people rather than the poorest in society. Well, yes, and I think uh, I think that is likely that we'll see a price cap. But I think it will differ from Labour's proposed price cap in that Labour proposed to pay for theirs with a windfall tax on energy companies or on gas companies, whereas Trust has ruled that out. Some reports suggest that she could pay for it through some sort of loan. So essentially, the public and businesses are given support now, but they have to pay it back over a longer term, which I don't think is going to go down particularly well with the public. But, you know, she's been she's been pretty open during this contest that she isn't interested in redistribution. She isn't interested in helping the poorest people in society at the expense of people who can afford it. Um, she was asked by Lord Koonsberg on, on, on Sunday specifically, you know, why is it that your your tax cuts vastly benefit the richest people in society over the poorest people in society? And she said, you know, this is fair. I believe it is fair. I don't believe in redistribution. So there is that kind of hardcore ideological right wing belief in trickle down economics that she that really does differentiate her from her predecessor. Mm, yeah. And uh, Hardy, we've kind of been here before, haven't we, with Margaret Thatcher. You may perhaps be too young to remember Margaret Thatcher, but this idea of trickle-down economics, the idea that if you allow the wealth creators to express themselves at their fullest, they will generate wealth for the economy and that everybody in society will eventually benefit through job creation and so on. Now, I would, I would suggest that most mainstream economists have discredited trickle-down economic theory, but it's one that Liz Truss and, and her economic guru, Patrick Minford, seem to cling to. Mm, it's interesting how much Thatcher is revived these days. I mean, she's always been there as a very iconic figure within conservative circles. But I've I've always been surprised by just how much we were hearing about all of the candidates saying that they were, you know, the successors, if you like, to Thatcher. Yeah, I think trickle down economics and the sort of the fallacy of it is one of the reasons why over a number of years we've ended up in the state of inequality we have in the UK today. And I think with the cost of living crisis, that is just one aspect that is underlying that crisis but has been bubbling and bubbling away we had the financial crash that contributed to it and it and at no point since the financial crisis did we have any real sense of intervention redistribution even when people needed it because of a crisis that hadn't been caused by anything they had done and we see the same thing again we're hearing more about you know austerity essentially you know Liz Truss doesn't like handouts she doesn't believe that uh, greed is a, is a bad word uh, is a dirty word and she's not committed to creating a fundamentally more equal society now that's not a big departure from recent conservative economic thinking especially I would say since Cameron onwards, you know, all through the austerity years. But it is, as Adam says, really concerning if she is going to stick quite rigidly to that. I we just don't see how that is complementary to the very real crisis people are facing. It's not a theoretical crisis. Presumably people really, really will be having to make difficult decisions. And so politically, you would think that Liz Truss would make that calculation that just in terms of our own popularity, our own political career, if she doesn't want it to be short-lived, you think there would be some intervention. But there's another fallacy as well that, again, is being thrown around quite a lot. I'm sure we'll hear more of it from Liz Truss when it comes to the economy about this notion of a household, that the UK economy has to pay down its debts. You know, we can't just give people money without 
you know, accounting for that somewhere. And that's not how people run their households. Now, Margaret Thatcher was a big proponent of that as well, the sort of the household fallacy. And I think that's another key economic framing we're still hearing, but it has been discredited over a number of years. Quite clearly, the UK economy you know, it's not like running a household where you make individual decisions. And, it, you know, I think quantitative easing isn't understood. So I think, unfortunately, the Conservative Bond of Trust may well try to capitalise on the lack of education people have generally about the economy in our society. And it will just increase the levels of inequality that already got us into this mess to this extent, rather than alleviate them. On the trickle down economics, I think it's she has been quite far to the right of, of many people in her own party, including, as we said, that Rishi Sunak, who was prior to his contest known for being a critic of, of that form of conservatism, but did point out several times during the course of the campaign that under conservative government, we have seen the corporation tax rate come down, it has been cut, and there hasn't been, as Liz Truss suggested there would be, a, a concurrent increase in growth or increase in investment from businesses coming into the UK and spending more money. So we haven't seen that kind of trickle down economics that Liz Truss says that she believes in. But despite that fact, and despite the sort of, you know, we can all see that growth is, is flatlining and we're heading into a recession for a long time now. She's not letting her opinion change with the facts. She's sticking with her sort of ideological position, which is that if you cut taxes for the wealthy, then it benefits everyone, even despite the fact that that is exactly not what has happened under her own government. And uh, Hardeep, I, I put this point to Adam uh, in a previous discussion recently. Liz Truss has criticised the national insurance contribution increase that Rishi Sunak brought in. Now, Sunak brought in the NI increase with a very specific plan. It was to stop people having to sell their homes if they needed social care later in their lives. And Johnson claimed credit for grasping the nettle that other politicians had failed to grasp in previous years. So he, he claimed credit for this bold move, but it was Sunak as Chancellor who introduced it. Liz Truss wants to row back on that. In the short term, the additional money raised through this national insurance increase, was to reduce the queues in the NHS caused not least by the pandemic. And I just wonder where all this is going to be paid for, because if you take the money from the additional NI increase out of the economy, we know that the NHS is already creaking, in fact, beyond creaking at the seams in many areas. So we can talk in theory, can't we, about a small state. People will notice are noticing this as they go to their local A&E, as they attempt to book a, a GP appointment. Yeah, exactly. As I said, it's not a theoretical uh, cost of living crisis uh, or cost of living standards crisis. It's it's going to really be felt. And I think the more questions there are about where funding is going to come from, the likes of the NHS, the more it will make people wonder whether this small state agenda is being pushed through and that it will open the door to yet more privatisation uh, within the NHS. We already know certain elements uh, of private health care are available. You know, people are increasingly saying, if you can afford it, go private because of the waiting lists on the NHS. But all of these bread and butter uh, elements, and I think Adams made this point uh, very well in, in his, his articles for Byline Times recently, you know, all, all of the sort of the notion of investment, uh, even the concept of the NHS, the levelling up agenda, this notion that you know, money does need to be spent uh, for the British public. Boris Johnson did understand that that was something that would be popular. And Liz Truss doesn't appear to be willing to go down that route. You know, So I think uh, the NI reduction is, is another instance of yeah, legitimate questions being asked about how is she going to fund everything? And is it not just going to lead to greater inflation and more of the crisis? And I guess we'll find out in the weeks ahead. I, I must say, I've heard one or two whispers and rumors. I don't know whether you've picked up anything uh, of this, Adam, but one or two people suggesting that because we're de facto developing a kind of two-stage or two-tier health service in this country, whether there is any appetite at the centre of government for in some way formalising that. Because as Hardy says at the moment, if you've got a condition that may be a chronic condition, not an emergency, but a chronic condition that needs seeing to, and you've got the money, common sense says you will attempt to go private if you can. And 
that's really a, a kind of a, a phenomenon that's gathering momentum. Well, we have not yet heard uh, directly from uh, either Truss or Sunak suggesting that, but there has been this kind of underlying murmur from the Conservative sporting commentariat that the NHS does have to think about, from their perspective, what it does and does not cover. And certainly in some of the rhetoric, and particularly that Rishi Sunak raised during this campaign, we've seen some, some kind of hint of that. Uh, he said several times at Hustings that you know, we need to think about the NHS continuing to gobble up so much of our money. He's also raised the prospect of introducing charges for if you miss your NHS appointments. Now, I think once you've kind of breached that barrier of charging for things on the NHS, then it's not a sort of huge leap to, to talk about charging for other parts of the NHS. I think there's, this is something that, that the kind of the left has always warned about with the Conservative Party is that they secretly want to go down that route. And certainly under previous Conservative leaders, there has been sort of suggestions of that. But it's always been seen as so sort of politically toxic for the Conservative Party to even sort of hint at that, that Boris Johnson certainly would never have, got, have gone down that route. Whether or not Liz Truss and some of the people around her would edge towards that, it remains to be seen. But given her position on lots of other similar issues that she's, she is shifting much further to the right. I don't think we can rule out that in at least in an element, there, there could be an element of that in her agenda going forward. A, a couple of other things in her entry, and they are connected, Adam. Brexit, the still unresolved Brexit that Boris Johnson promised to get done. We have the Northern Ireland Protocol, which the government itself signed up to and then now wants to renege on. We've got the position of Scotland within the United Kingdom and the moves towards Scottish independence, which we are told the government will seek to squelch by introducing new legislation that would make it much more difficult to vote for independence in Scotland. These are the kinds of issues that are not going to be solved by any major new policy announcements. No. Well, there are all these whole series of sort of intractable issues, Brexit, um, Scotland as well, um, in which didn't really feature very much in the campaign at all. Indeed, Brexit, which was the number one issue at the last general election, barely featured at all in the hustings. It was rarely raised and neither candidate had much to say about it. However, it is still a major concern for British businesses are suffering. Trade with our closest uh, trading partners has slumped. But we have seen some indication of where we may be going on that. We, we know that Truss's position on the Northern Ireland Protocol. But we also know that she is likely to choose Jacob Rees-Mogg as her business and energy secretary. And he's had some interesting things to say in recent weeks and months about Brexit. Particularly, he has suggested that it could be seen as an opportunity for the government to cut back on workers' rights and on vi environmental protections and on food standards. And there has been some suggestions... Uh, certainly in this weekend's papers, that List Trust may have sympathy with some of that agenda. Now, these are things that under Boris Johnson, the government were very keen to actually dismiss any suggestions that the government might go down that route. And some of the sort of few times where I, I got aggressive pushback from uh, Downing Street was when uh, I ever made any suggestion that that may be the direction that they were heading in. It seems that under Trust and, under, and potentially under uh, a new business secretary, Jacob rees if in indeed he is in that role, that we could actually see a shift towards that, where Brexit is used as a sort of opportunity to strip back people's rights, strip back regulations, and kind of turn the UK into, into what lots of people uh, on the Remain side warned that they would try and do, is turn the UK into a kind of sort of Singapore, Singapore on the Thames. I and mean, I think that potentially is, is quite, would be quite a worrying development. We're going to have a couple of contributors join us in a moment, David and uh, Mordecai, and we'd welcome anybody who's listening to this who's got a sensible contribution to make. But uh, one other thing I want to question you about, Hardeep, and this follows an article you wrote in the Byline Times recently in the print edition, and we should stress that the only way you can see some of the excellent content of the Byline Times is getting the print edition. That involves taking out a subscription. Get more details at bylinetimes.com, as well as getting a fantastic monthly newspaper. You're helping to support Byline Radio radio and the byline times podcast but you wrote about the ethnic diversity of boris johnson's cabinet hardy because it was by historical british standards a remarkably diverse cabinet yet it didn't feel as though it was a, a cabinet that had lots of sympathy or lots of connection with people from diverse backgrounds and there was that kind of conundrum at the heart of it that you sought to tackle 
Yes, I think it's, it's a really interesting debate. And we've spoken about this before, but as we've seen during the Conservative leadership contest, there was a lot of uh, discussion around whether the rise of figures such as Rishi Sunak and Priti Patel and Kemi Badenoch and Swilla Braverman, both of whom are expected to get cabinet positions under trust, whether that represents progress for ethnic minorities in this country or not. So there's a lot of discussion around that. And for me, it's it's a really nuanced complicated, complex subject. Because, of course, we have the most diverse cabinet. And whenever in his tenure, Boris Johnson was asked uh, anything to do with racism or Islamophobia or the Black Lives Matter movement or the the race report, the Sewell reports, which was widely discredited, whenever he was asked anything about these things, his main response was to point to his cabinet, literally point to the front bench and say, how can we have any problems with anything to do with race or racism or inequality with regards to racial outcomes when we have have all of these people of colour occupying the highest offices of state. So it appears to be quite a conundrum, I think, especially for the left to tackle, you know, how do you explain that? But in this article, The Identity Trap, which is actually available um, on our website now as well to read, the basic point was that rather than saying that these figures such as Rishi Sunak and Patel and Braverman and and Badenoch are, are sort of selling out in some way, they're not real ethnic minorities or they really, really don't care about the communities they come from. Um, and indeed, they all say that they care a lot about their backgrounds and are really proud of them. Uh, rather than seeing seeing them and their behavior and their political ideologies through that lens, I argue that actually we need to see them as individuals, people who are partisan politicians, who have not necessarily transcended, if you like, their race, but have transcended the idea that racism can or will hold you back, because fundamentally, it's not the experience they've had. So really, the framing of this is a notion on the left that actually representation in politics is about giving back to one's community, about bettering the lives of other people from those communities with race as as a key element of that, versus uh, what you get on the right increasingly with these candidates, which is a much more individualistic framing, which is Patel and Sunak, they would argue they do want to improve people's lives in this country, but not because of their race or their ethnicity. And why shouldn't they hold the beliefs they do, even if those beliefs are right wing, uh, because that in itself is racist. So really, Really complicated one, but really what I'm trying to say is people are more complicated, identity is more complicated than we might like to think. Yeah, absolutely. And it is a fascinating read. Go check it out at bylinetimes.com. And don't forget that Hardy edits the Byline Times as well. Great monthly newspaper. You can get details at bylinetimes.com of how to subscribe. I know that uh, Hardy and Adam are very busy, so if they want to duck out, that's absolutely fine. We're also going to be joined shortly by uh, Jeevan Sander, who's an economist at UCL in London. But let's hear from uh, David Henry, who's joined us today. Hello, David. Welcome. Hello from Scotland. <laughs> Lovely to have you with us, David. Yeah, go on, yeah. David. So I am actively involved uh, in politics up here. I was in the SNP uh, uh, as an office bearer, part of Joanna Cherry's campaign team uh, every single time. Um, and I'm now uh, in the Alba party. Um, I watch with astonishment that England keeps going down this route. I think Boris has been a disaster. I was actually in the House of Commons the day he became the leader and prime minister and sat through his speech. And the one thing I took away from it is apart from he was playing to his own crowd and not taking the job or the the institution seriously, it was all a big joke to him. Um, Nobody got a straight answer um, from any of the opposing benches. Um, But I think the thing that I took away from that, and that was in 2019, I think, uh, was uh, one of the uh, guards, uh, I think if that's what you call them, in an unusual outfit, walking through the House of Commons. And Boris's answer, he made some flippant, obviously meant to be a very humorous and joking answer to, uh, uh, I think it was Corbyn at the time. Uh, And this person's reaction who has obviously been in the House of Commons a long time, was to look his eyes to heaven and an expression on his face, and what the hell is that? And I actually took away from there that this was the end of the United Kingdom. 
Brexit, as you probably all know, uh, Scotland, 62% voted Remain. That was simply ignored. We don't live in a democracy. This is not a united kingdom of democratic equals. Scotland's vote was ignored. And there was a clear majority to stay in the EU. And our economy is being damaged, as was predicted, uh, as Scotland exports more than it imports. Um, oh, well, sorry to interrupt, David. I saw somebody um, posting on Twitter that Liz Truss is Prime Minister, having been elected by 80,000 members of the Conservative Party. Mm. Nicola Sturgeon has the support, or her party has the support, of 1.2 million Scots. <laughs> uh, which, which one, asks the person on Twitter, is likely to be dismissed as not legitimate, by certainly by the the mainstream press in England. And obviously, we know the answer to that. It's a rhetorical mm. question, isn't it? But, you know, on these questions of legitimacy, and I, I find it really quite disturbing that there are these suggestions now, and it's only a suggestion, I should stress, mm. that Trust might introduce legislation mm-hmm. to ensure that in any further future Scottish independence mm. referendum, not only would it be done on a 50, you know, 51 to 49 percent vote with the, the majority taking mm. spoils, as it were, but it would have to be the majority of the electorate. <laughs> it's a test that is never applied to any other yes. election or vote in the UK. Yeah. And indeed, had it been applied to Brexit, the yes. UK would still be We'd in the We'd still European. be in the EU, yeah. Um, and I wouldn't be getting bills for my mobile phone from Cyprus. Um, yeah, so I all I would say, looking from the top, and I'm obviously very politically active. I've made quite a few speeches um, at party conference. I've got two more coming up in October, one on the energy crisis. Um, I watch with horror that nobody seems to understand that the energy crisis has been created by having a fake marketplace. Uh, These were public utilities. They should be for the public good. That's ignoring the fact that the gas and oil that everyone keeps referring to is not the United Kingdom's. It is Scotland's. When it comes to legitimacy, and and this is, uh, it started with David Cameron. He made a huge mistake of, first of all, granting a referendum, thinking he was going to easily win it, and then watching the polls slowly move further and further away. Um, The turnout, I don't know if you're aware, but the turnout um, in the Scottish referendum in 2014 blows everything the UK has had in modern history. 84% turnout and 55% voted no. Yes, they were also offered um, extra powers and then none of these things have uh, been delivered. So there is a growing anger that Scotland is an energy rich country and yet we're being hit with increasing energy bills because of a totally flawed conservative policy of the market will decide, sell it all off. Uh, They're much better at running things. The proof should be there for everybody to see. The banking system collapsed. We had to step in and save it. And yet if we believe in market forces, we should have let it fail. The same is happening with the energy crisis. If we believe in the marketplace as being the most efficient way to deliver public services, then let it fail. But we're not. We're stepping in to save it with public money. Well, the, the shareholders should have been paying for all of this, not the customers and consumers. So I think there is a huge problem. And I don't think, Liz, anything I've heard Liz or um, Rashi say tells me they actually understand what the real problem is. I'm proposing this October, and it will become newsworthy very shortly, that uh, I believe Ofgem is breaking competition law by how it's operating. It's come up and fixed the price for energy. The energy cap is a single price cap. That's actually against competition law to, to rig markets. And it doesn't take into account or is linked to how you've generated the energy. Scotland is 97.5% of its electricity comes from renewables. The cost of generating renewables has actually gone down, not up. It's burning gas to generate electricity that has got is the problem. So I'm proposing that Ofgem should have and should be put forced to publish a price cap for renewable energy. Yeah, Professor Sir Michael Marmot made that point on the podcast very recently as well when he was talking about health inequality that yeah. – then the renewables now, the price of renewables is is rising because of the rise of 
the electricity and gas. Yeah. yeah. Not because the cost of renewables has actually gone up. David, I'm going right. to move on because we've got yeah. a lot of people. Thank you for asking me to speak. Very interesting. Great to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, Thank let's you. hear from uh, Morty in the United States. Hello, Morty. Welcome. Hey, Adrian. How are you? Yeah, nice to speak to you. Go on, mate. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, I think Hardeep, at the beginning of the discussion, she said that Liz Truss is basically a continuation of the Johnson administration. And uh, yes, that seems to be true. On the other hand, uh, Adam uh, and Hardeep both made the point that she has quite different opinions or uh, she's going to be taking a different uh, slant towards economics, Brexit, NHS. Fine, I can understand that. And that's within the conservative party, which she now leads. However, if that conservative party with her uh, mandate with her agenda had been put at the 2019 election, and now the entire UK would be voting against or toward her new agenda, which we're now seeing, versus whatever Labour would offer. So would they really like to have her as their prime minister? It makes me wonder if she might be great for the Conservative Party, but is she really good as the Prime Minister for the UK? Mm. I mean, this does go to the heart of her legitimacy, doesn't it, really? Whether the electorate that elected her was in any way representative of the UK as a whole, and it manifestly is not. I mean, it's just one of those hypotheticals, isn't it, that we shall never know whether this kind of manifesto would have won election. It has to be said, I mean, other parties in the UK's first-past-the-post system have changed horses in midstream. We have had handovers before from one leader to another when Labour has been in power. So it, it does go on. We have a system whereby one party is the overall winner, then that party chooses its leader, who we then have as prime minister, although, of course, we usually know ahead of time who that prime minister is likely to be. So in that sense, it's in keeping with British the traditions of British politics. Whether those traditions are logical or indeed helpful to the nation is a, is a very moot point. I think maybe you have to take up the US, <laughs> the US model. Although you're Britain and you would definitely not well, do well, that. Yeah, but I mean, there's also the European, I mean, you know, loads of European countries have proportional representation. There's a lot of pressure building, I think, for a progressive alliance, as it's sometimes called on the left, involving Labour, the Liberal Democrats and the Greens, possibly including the SNP in Scotland and Plaid Cymru in Wales as well. And if you look at the uh, arithmetic of England, for example, if Scotland were to leave the UK, it's hard to imagine the Conservatives not being the main party in England under first past the post. So if Labour want to preserve any kind of future for themselves as a party of power, they might have to go down the way of PR. But my sense is that Labour is rather unwilling to do that because they still dream of first past the post and being the, the leading party. I could be proved wrong. We shall see. Good to speak to you anyway. Thank you, Mordecai. Lovely to hear from you. Um, Thanks. I think Omar's also in the United States. Hello, Omar. How are you doing? You're right. Yes, uh, very well. And thank you, Adrian, for hosting this. Really, really good as always. And thank you also to everyone who's contributed. Really appreciate hearing from everyone. I want to just uh, say a couple of things. Uh, you've titled this Hopes and Fears. Well, one of my hopes is that the general election would be tomorrow, um, but, but we know that's not going to take place. Uh, <laughs> and, and my fears are what everybody has been articulating so far, which is um, I think you're going to be seeing not only more of the same, but more extremes from Liz Truss, uh, as everyone I think is, is, is seeming to genuflect to. Um, first of all, when, when the cabinet announcements are made shortly, we will start to really see the proof of that pudding. Many of these people are going to be the same people, of course, who were in Johnson's cabinet and a few others. But the point that I really want to make here, and I think, Adrian, you brought this up a few moments ago when you talked about um, people changing stream in parties during elections or, you know, just before elections. We've had a several handovers in the conservative leadership in the last few years, and you talked about Labour. I think it's going to happen again. 
Um, quite frankly, and it may sound cynical, I don't think that this trust is going to last these two years until 2024's general election. I, I, I just have this sneaky feeling. A, this party is far too divided. B, I think that what you're going to see with this cost of living crisis is going to put more pressure on the party as a whole to try to make itself viable somehow uh, for the 2024 general um, Labour's going to have the momentum that it's going to have and hopefully take advantage of it. And Adrian, I think that, you know, maybe six months to a year before the general, you might see someone like a Ben Wallace, who didn't run this time as uh, for the leadership, um, as the candidate who might sneak in there and become their new leader just in time for the general. I know it may sound a little cynical and a little bit uh, conspiratorial, but I think that you're going to see that happen uh, and, uh, because, as you pointed out and others have pointed out, this trust's legitimacy is certainly uh, certainly in question. Well, we're, we're seeing, Omar, I don't know how uh, closely you follow, but I think you follow pretty closely uh, UK yeah. politics and you're from this country originally. And uh, you will have been aware, perhaps, over the weekend, there were stories of uh, police forces around the country fearing social unrest in the coming months with the rising price of fuel in particular, but the cost of living uh, crisis generally. And I, I don't want to be a doom monger. I don't want to see rioting on the streets. That kind of thing terrifies me, quite frankly. But we do know, don't we, them, that when people feel that their their backs are against the wall, sometimes they do respond with violence. And, and that's we, we have this very curious situation as well at the UK at the moment. You know, it's not like the 1980s when a lot of people were out of work. We have a lot of people in work, but feeling that they're not getting a fair deal. So we have this massive upsurge now in industrial unrest. As I say, we have the NHS, which I think is a, an underreported slow motion disaster unfolding in this country. And yeah, I think you might be right. I think whether, whether Liz Truss <laughs> survives two years may well be uh, very, very questionable. Absolutely, absolutely. And and uh, the quick, just a quick answer to what you said about the really non-reported uh, NHS situation, 100% on that. Um, it is like the, bo the uh, forgive my analogy, it's like the frog in boiling water. Mm. And excessive conservative governments and, and leadership um, have been doing everything, in my view, to undermine the NHS or, or to try to at least section off or privatize parts of it or uh, gradations of it, if you will. Uh, Jeremy Hunt, when he was health secretary, um, I think was among those and others were. And I fear that that could get worse. So, Adrian, we'll see what happens indeed. Yeah, Omar, great to hear from you. Thank you. If you do want to join in, by the way, and you're listening on the Twitter app and you're listening live on Byline Radio, on the Twitter app in the bottom left-hand corner on your phone anyway, there should be a little purple microphone. Tap that to request access. And as long as you've got something sensible to say, I'll let you on. It'd be good to hear from you wherever you are. I want to welcome now Dr. Jeevan Sander. Jeevan is a, an economist at King's College London. Great to have you on, Jeevan. And obviously, you've got a an economist's head on the arrival of Liz Truss. I, I'm, I'm just trying to work out how a tax-cutting prime minister fits into a situation which would seem to demand much greater mm. public spending, whether it's the cost of living crisis, whether it's the NHS. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't think we know where, where we're sitting. I mean, look, she... In one sense, every single leadership candidate faced this kind of unsquarable circle. You know, on the one hand, the public wanted more spending and definitely higher taxes on the rich. The Conservative membership want lower taxes and quite often as well, lower spending. It's very difficult to actually could square that circle. I mean, why did Trust win this leadership election? Because she told the Conservative Party what they wanted to hear. She told them that all you need to do is to cut taxes and deregulate and keep fighting as well with the European Union. And, you know, the economic lands of plenty will come. And that really was like the fairy tale economics that she sold. And alongside that, of course, what has been kind of a trademark of trust has been this kind of version of toddler politics, where she says every single time something goes wrong, it's someone else's fault. Uh, it's the European, it's the Remainer elite, it's the wokeness of this country. And so I think that's the way we're going to see her govern. It's certainly the way that she campaigned. In the time ahead, certainly it does look like we will need a lot more extra spending. Uh, the tax cuts won't really help. So at the moment, her tax cuts go about £400 to the average family. 
they're facing an increase in bills of over £2,000. And let's not forget, other prices are going up as well. The energy price freeze, I think that she's, it seems she's proposing this morning, looks to me to give the average value about £600, but some very limited information. Certainly not enough to kind of get the public through what will be an incredibly and a catastrophic winter ahead. You know, that, this isn't just about people going into destitution or further into destitution. We should be going into this with 2.6 million kids going hungry. It also means a winter where, frankly, middle-class families are going to go to the war without a lot more help from the government. Speaking to Professor Sir Michael Marmot, who's an expert in health inequality for the podcast the other day, and I would recommend you go back and listen to that podcast. Michael Marmot talking about how, in 2013, the programme for insulation of homes in this country was pretty much halted in its tracks. And Cameron famously said, we want to get rid of all the green crap. And the result of that is that we have more deaths from cold in the United Kingdom than they do in Finland. Reckoned to be already more than 6,000 deaths a year from cold in this country. And that's before this current energy prices, mm. uh, energy crisis. So... <laughs> The, the kind of measures that are being talked about really don't scratch the surface of the scale of that impending catastrophe. I know Martin Lewis, the consumer expert, has attracted criticism from likes of uh, Edwina Curry, the former Conservative Health Secretary, for using phrases like catastrophe. But Lewis kind of doubles down on that and says, no, this is a catastrophe. I'm not mm-hmm. catastrophizing. It is a catastrophe in the making. Yeah, and he's right. I mean, look, we were already in crisis, right? I mean, before this moment as well, remember life expectancy was stalling just before COVID struck. We were seeing it falling in the most deprived areas. And, and Michael Marmot will, will tell you this in a lot more detail, but we know that most of our, our health care isn't really determined by how good our health system is, but how good everything else is. You know, do you have enough a good job? Do you have enough money to buy the essentials? Are you not constantly stressed out worrying about how to pay the bills and one of the reasons why we've seen such huge falls in healthcare, such huge rises in demand, is because of the deprivation that has been spreading throughout this country. You know, even without this kind of huge increase of energy prices this winter, we would still have a, a hunger crisis in this country. We would still have people going into destitution. We still have more than two million pensioners in poverty. And when you add this on top, it is this catastrophe that's coming coming our way, and it puts more pressure on our public services. In terms of Truss's own ideology of tax cuts, tax cuts, tax cuts, you know, tax cuts don't help pensioners pay the bills. They don't help feed hungry kids either. And it's not clear if either she kind of understands that or it seems to be in her and both Kwasi Kwarteng, you know, have this faith, this ideology that says, if you just cut taxes, everything will be fine. And the truth is that, you know, lower taxes are not the route to kind of milk and honey. You know, if all that mattered was tax rates, how low they were, then Somalia would be richer than Sweden. That's not the case because you need more than low taxes. You know, you need a functioning public services, you need a well-educated workforce, you need proper infrastructure, and all those things take spending. And that's not where trust is at the moment. It certainly doesn't fill me much hope for the, the future or indeed the winter ahead. Yeah, I think I heard somebody say on one of these broadcasts the other day that many voters seem to want European style social services with american style taxes <laughs> i mean you can't have both at the same time can you no you can't i mean look the other thing of course that is is actually you get growth up you get productivity up and actually one thing we haven't spoken about and it was kind of rather during this leadership contest as was mentioned earlier was brexit you know a key reason why our investment rates are so low why productivity is so low is because ever since 2016 businesses haven't known what they're going to be facing with you know what's their trading relationship going to be if you end up with a trade war with the u with the european union rather what trust is seems to be suggesting that's like an extra 10 percent tax on every single business well they don't want to invest at that point in time and that reduces growth and it reduces productivity so in one sense you know they have some idea of the diagnoses of the problems that we have but no idea of how to actually solve them or indeed much of an interest in the evidence about what does and doesn't work getting to growth and what will be kind of required in the in the months and years ahead. Earlier on, Hardeep mentioned this kind of false analogy that is often made and particularly made by economists on the right about the the household economy, as it were, and the international or national economy. The idea that 
in your purse you might have 50 pounds and you can't spend more than 50 pounds and if you if you're gonna if you want to spend more than 50 pounds you have to wait for your next paycheck to come in before you your purse gets filled up again for, for people who don't get why that is a poor analogy for mm. national economics just explain why it's it's kind of just just doesn't really work the way to think about it is is borrowing as an investment proposition. So you as a, an individual, when you buy a house, you know you take out a, a loan or a mortgage, and the loan to income ratio on your mortgage will be about three to one. Okay. Now, where the British government is at the moment with debt one hundred percent to GDP, is our loan to income ratio is about one. So we're really far away from any financing constraint. And on top of that, as well, governments don't die, but people do. So in, in our lifetimes, we have to pay down our debts to zero, but governments don't do that. And so governments do borrow and have a lot more capacity to borrow. The real question is, what are you borrowing for? And does the return on investment make sense? You know, is there a positive return for, for your borrowing? So if you're investing in infrastructure, especially if you're investing, by the way, in net zero, where the return accrues for every generation yet to come, absolutely it makes sense to borrow to invest, just as any business would, and indeed as individuals do. The problem comes actually with kind of, if you're borrowing to fund massive tax cuts, you know, that's a, a wasted opportunity and it's a poor investment proposition. And that's where she sits. So when we're thinking about borrowing, we should really think about why is it we borrow and what's the point? Because actually borrowing helps us do um, great things, right? That's not just about buying a house, but also investing into businesses. You know, people do take on debt and they do so to kind of further their productive capacity. And what is true there for a nation as well? Yeah, and indeed, I mean, capitalism itself is partly powered by borrowing, isn't it? The, the, the idea that you have a reservoir of capital, which you may well have borrowed from somebody at a rate of interest, which you then use perhaps to found a new factory or to create a new company. In a sense, borrowing is at the heart of capitalism. It just seems weird that conservative politicians have such a downer on borrowing when actually it's at the core of the system that they're propagating it's yeah it's certainly true it's, you know we will look back at that in this last decade as, as such a way you know no one's really talking about george osborne at the moment and i understand why but there's no kind of osborneites at the moment i mean if we look at where quasi quarting you know the piece of new chancellor is like at the moment he is saying absolutely let's let's start borrowing more so even they've seen kind of you know the failure of their own ideology right or at least their major economic policy for at least the six to seven years leading up to Brexit. But of course, they're not going to say, oh, we got that really, really wrong. You know, they're now saying, actually, we're going to borrow loads more money because it makes sense to, and not really thinking about about why. And, you know, it's it, it's a, a tragic shame. You know, we wasted, it wasn't just the misery that was caused, we wasted that six to seven years. Right? Interest rates, of course, were also incredibly low. And then you talk about home insulation, like we could have been making investments in the 2010 in renewables, in home insulation, that means this winter was not going to be anywhere near as rough as it is now. Now, we're paying for the cost of not investing in our future. In one sense, the not prudent choice to borrow, uh, to borrow to invest and to borrow in our future capacity. Yeah, you just think for a, a, a few billion quid at a time when interest rates were very low, you could potentially have insulated every home in the country. Mm. And the solutions now, Johnson's announced this big nuclear power plant. That was one of his farewell gifts to the nation. Uh, whether or not that comes to pass, we shall have to see. But you look at the potential for renewables, you look at the way in which renewables are already powering a significant amount of our energy needs but we're still talking about granting new licenses for north sea oil and gas exploration if we made the decision to pivot as a nation to fully renewable energy and invested in that that would dramatically push down energy bills for every household in the country in future and do so much as well towards achieving our net zero target yeah, it seems like a, a no-brainer, right? And the other thing to say also about, about this debate is something that, you know, on the left, people feel a lot more uncomfortable with is actually the role of nuclear as well. You know, one of the problems we have with the, with the grid as it starts with renewables is the intermittent nature of, of surges means, one, the grid isn't built for it, and two, the batteries at this point in time don't seem to be good enough, which is why, you know, in the mid-2000s, it was, it was the new Labour government talking about nuclear. So at that point, they were saying, Actually, yes, we can expand renewables, but we need another another at least bridging kind of solution. 
And that would have been the, the solution, but we, we wasted a decade. But now, look, um, the best time to do it is now. Um, but at this point, it doesn't look like where the, the trust government is is going. You know, she doesn't want to have solar panels on farmland. And, like, I don't really understand why, because they look kind of fine to me. But apparently that's not, not where she is. Indeed not. Jeevan, great to hear from you. Thank you. Dr. Jeevan Sander from King's College London, an economist and political commentator. Great to hear from you, Jeevan. Thanks for your time. Uh, let's get a final word in this conversation from Brian. Hello, Brian, in Northern Ireland. How are you doing? You're right. Yeah, not too bad. Uh, great that, that Northern Ireland's getting the final word in this. And I suppose um, what Liz Truss uh, can do or, or bring to Northern Ireland uh, is important. Um, we, we currently have no assembly. Um, we currently have no executive. Um, we, we have sort of this interim caretaker managers in position at the minute. Um, so it's really important what Liz Truss does uh, next for Northern Ireland on the, the protocol bill. Um, for me, she can either uh, reject it or push it through um, to sort of delay data around it doesn't really help anyone. Uh, and I think what's important is, is she looks at how she can reform Northern Ireland, um, you know, how she can uh, move away from, from one party or another being able to hold uh, politics to ransom in Northern Ireland. I think that would be what we would like to see from her in Northern Ireland is reform of the institutions and some sort of clear and definitive way forward on the, the Northern Ireland uh, protocol um, <laughs> is what we need. Uh, do you th- Honestly, do you think you'll get that, Brian? I don't know. Um, you know, I think I think the UK government got to 1998 and the Good Friday Agreement um, and sort of went, that's us done with Northern Ireland at times. Um, you know, they haven't really accepted the responsibility of the mess that we're currently in. They, they had a huge part to play in that. Um, so we haven't really had a PM that's really focused in on Northern Ireland and how to really make true change to to give us um, a hope. So I, I'm hopeful that, that Liz Truss will listen to the likes of the Alliance Party. You've had a huge surge in, in Northern Ireland to reform the institutions and, and hopefully provide us with stable government. But the DUP seem to have her ear at the minute with the protocol bill. Um, maybe there's a compromise there that... Uh, we we push through the protocol bill, we get the uh, assembly back up and running, and then we push for reform. Brian, I hope Liz Truss is listening to Byline Radio. You never know, do you? Great to hear from you. Thank you, Brian in Northern Ireland. And thank you to everybody who's taken part. Thank you to David in Scotland, to uh, Morty and to Omar in the United States, to uh, Jeevan and to Hardeep and to Adam Bienkoff. I'm Adrian Goldberg. This has been Byline Radio, or if you're listening on Catch Up, to the Byline Times podcast. Don't forget, this is all funded by subscriptions to the brilliant Byline Times, a great monthly newspaper. You get details on how to subscribe, and believe me, it's very reasonable. You get details on how to subscribe at bylinetimes.com. That's bylinetimes.com. Thanks, everyone. See you soon now. Cheers.